Oop. Mate. Josh Burns, everybody. <laughs> Was that recording? A little bit. We've got, we've got the end of it, so that's good enough. But how do we bring people with us? That's, like, that's the question of this election when it comes to climate policy. How do we bring people who rely on fossil fuel industries with us on this journey of climate change? I do think that in terms of being willing to take on market forces in the interest of ordinary Australians in order to ensure that Australians have access to opportunity. The Labor Party is the only party that has really dedicated itself to that cause. And I think last election, you know, when you're talking about some of these communities who sort of push back on the convoy of people who went up to Queensland, you know, screaming at them saying, you know, you're, you're like, your jobs need to be sacrificed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like, like, of course they went back and said, get stuffed, right? When I first became an MP, I had like about a week where I didn't get the keys to my office and I was just kind of waiting and I needed something to take my mind off the impatience. Yeah. And which, you know, was, was sort of a pointless thing to do. And then I had a friend who we used to do races and it became a bit competitive. It just is a bit like, it's a bit cathartic to have a Rubik's Cube. And I can't look at one that's not. There we go. And not solve it. And not solve it. Oop. Mate. Josh Burns, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> was that recording? A little bit. We've got, we've got the end of it, so that's good enough. That was unsolved before. We could also have done it in reverse. We could have just had you sit there and with just, a solved one and just... Like a high... Yeah. We, do, we do it in reverse. <laughs> and then it's just all jumbled. <laughs> That'd be and, great. Yeah, and people think, oh God, he just buggered that up. Me spitting a bit of tea out. Happy days. Mate, thanks for coming, coming by. It's really my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me cube at the start of our conversation. Yeah, I mean... It was just there asking to be solved. And that's what we want. We want proactive MPs who just solve problems when they see them. That's a, that's a great segue. Do you know, most of society will be thinking and going, oh, like, oh, you can solve the Rubik's Cube. That's, that's kind of cool. But anyone who's ever solved the Rubik's oh, yeah. Cube will look at me and go, that guy is just such an amateur. How's the gimmick? How's He's the so slow? <laughs> He's so slow. Wrong. He's like, wrong. A, like a kid can do it much better than that. I'm not talented at all. I just sort of remembered stuff. Just, I just had, you just had a week. As you said, you had, a, you had a spare week to learn how to do the <laughs> Rubik's Cube waiting for the keys. That's it. Was that for Barclay Street? For Barclay Street. Yeah. Yeah. You're the federal member for McNamara. Yeah. Used to be Melbourne Ports. Yeah. Were you, are you the first member for McNamara then? I am. I am. So the Australian Electoral Commission made the decision to rename the seat of Melbourne Ports McNamara uh, at the last federal election. And it's named after Dame Jean McNamara. And she was one of the first female doctors at the Royal Children's Hospital. And she also was pivotal in developing the polio vaccine. So, oh, yeah. uh, and, and, and actual fact, her granddaughter still lives in McNamara. She's a doctor. And throughout the pandemic was... Uh, one of the key local health um, providers who did thousands of vaccinations of the local of basically the electorate of McNamara during the campaign during the during the pandemic. So it's sort of this, you know, this her grandmother Dame Jean McNamara helped treated people during the polio epidemic, and her granddaughter, who is a doctor and a, become a good friend of mine, uh, is also amazing community servant who have been vaccinating our local community. And we've come full circle. Amazing. Yeah. Love to see the legacy. Love to see the legacy uh, in the area and not see everyone run away. Although I live here also and it's a wonderful place to live. I can't, I can't deny that. It's a beautiful part of Melbourne. Um, I was going to, I was looking at before, often we'll do a bit of an introduction. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how about we don't do an introduction? Because really what you probably don't get a chance to do very often is actually just talk about what's got, like you and what's happening. You know, there's particularly election seasons coming up. There's lots of arguments either way that just get whipped around. You're good, that's terrible, that's terrible. You've done this terribly. And we'll get to some of that later on. Yeah. But I thought people also want to know about people. And for some reason, we don't pay that much attention for two and a half years. Mm. And then for six months, everyone's in your face all the time and then we don't <laughs> see it too much. Is that something that annoys you a bit about the job? I think over the three years of being a member of parliament, you do spend a lot of time trying to connect with our community. I mean, I've, I grew up in in Caulfield, and I, I, you know, I used to play basketball in Albert Park, and I used to work in Port Melbourne, and my grandparents lived in Elwood, and you know, St Kilda is sort of was always my second home. So I, I feel so connected to the area already. But 
it's different when you're the member of parliament and you do have to spend time getting to know the different corners of, of our community. So I think over that period, it doesn't feel like I've sort of kept to myself. It feels like I've spent really the last couple of years trying to, uh, trying to really connect with different parts of our local area. And as a member of parliament, you, you know, you have the privilege of being able to do so. So yeah, I do feel though that the focus on politics and the focus on us as members of parliament or as politicians, it obviously heightens during the election and it obviously becomes far more intense. And yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, it's like footy final season. You know, yeah. we, the, the season was playing, but when, when the finals happen, that's when everyone really pays attention. Got any dirty laundry you want to air here before, before it gets leaked by someone else or? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Okay, I'd love to break something for no reason on my silly little, you know. Yeah, in, yeah, in my yeah. No, like, like world scoop. This will be <laughs> yeah, in the in the Aussies, sort of, you know. So you know, um, Josh didn't put the toilet seat down one time, <laughs> and uh, he's here to he's here to tell all. So, so one thing I did do during lockdown, which which I'd always had this sort of because we had a bit more time uh, at home, sort of. Yeah, you know, we all did. Everyone home, in Melbourne did. Yeah, definitely. Plenty of time. I learned how to make pastrami. Okay. And which, which is a really long process where you've got to like, you know, you've got to brine mm -hmm. the brisket. You need big buckets. Yeah. And then you've got to smoke it and then you've got to steam it and it's this whole big process. Then you make the... Anyway, so the big scoop that I'm releasing on your show is that I learned how to make a pretty bloody good piece of pastrami over the lockdown. And your doctor's shaking his head going, this bloke eating four pastrami sandwiches a day. He doesn't need any more pastrami. No more pastrami for this guy. Yeah. So you grew up in you grew up in Caulfield. Is Caulfield still in McNamara? Is that yeah. yeah, it is. So so half of it is Caulfield North and Caulfield East. So anything north of Glen Huntley Road. So if people know Glen Huntley Road, Elstonwick, it's there's a shopping strip. Anything towards Glen Ira Road is in McNamara and yeah. anything towards North Road's in Goldstein with my neighbour. Your mate. Tim Wilson. Is it strange to have I mean, I find it strange to have kind of chalk and cheese butting up to each other like the neighbours over the fence. Yeah, like like you know, we we sort of Throw the throw the scraps over to his side of the house, and then he throws it back. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, no, look, Tim, Tim and I obviously have completely different political worldviews. He he um, comes from the you know the IPA school of politics, uh, and I certainly don't. Um, but on some local matters, you do try and put politics aside when you are different members of parliament. Certainly with state members of parliament, you do try and work together, even though they're on the other side of politics. For things that matter to your local community, it is best to try and put local things first. Yes. On local stuff, we, we do try and get on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why did you get into politics in the first place? I heard a great quote one time, yeah. and I love it. Yeah. And it's anyone who wants to be a politician should automatically be banned from being one. That's true. That's true. <laughs> and I sort of, so sometimes I think, I talk to people, I go, all right then, why, why, what was the call to arms? Yeah. I, I never... I never sort of had the ambition of being a politician, but I did have the ambition to work in politics. I wanted to be involved in politics. I studied at a university, I studied history, and I, I always was, you know, I was always sort of politically minded growing up. And for me, it wasn't as important as, so being a member of parliament wasn't as important as just having a chance to either work in government or work in some part of the political realm mm -hmm. to be able to, yeah, to be involved in the most prominent organization that helps make our society function well or not. And can we, you know, the, the biggest levers of change in our society happen in government and happen in, in our political conversations. And I've always found those conversations to be worthwhile. And, and, and you know, if people don't think about our world around us, then then our democracy and our institutions will dissolve. And that, they, these things aren't an automatic part of our country. Yeah. It's only if people nurture them and nurture our society and help create and foster the sort of society that we want to live in. So for me, it wasn't, it wasn't how do I become an MP? It was how do I be involved in politics? And that was the dream. And I remember actually, Josh, I was... I was great name by the way. Oh, um, yeah, to, yeah, to yeah, the very rights. strong, very yeah. strong. Um, I remember I was sitting in... I was working for a, in the private sector for a company called Pearson, which is a great publishing company. They sort of 
the company that owns Penguin. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember sitting at my desk and I sort of looked over at the managing director, which was sort of my, my boss's 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 boss, right? And I sort of said to myself, you know, like I've got a good job, the company's looking after me, it's a great, you know, I can, I can have a career here. And I sort of said, do I want to spend the next 15 years of my life in that process of getting to that promotion, you know, to yeah. get to that senior position in this organization? Because that's what it would take. It would take you 10, 15 years of, you know, climbing the ladder. And for me, I couldn't bring myself to, to wanting to give my life to that clause. But when I, when I sort of then, I then became a part-time political officer and I sort of thought to myself, do I want to spend the next 10 or 15 years potentially getting into a senior political role, you know, either chief of staff or you know, something? Uh, and I thought, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Do I want to spend the next 10, 15 years of my life trying to influence political outcomes in this country? And I feel very privileged that I've been given the opportunity to do so. I feel like you did it quicker than 15 years. Yeah, I did it. I did it. I did it. I got to become a member of parliament in, in about 10 years, which was pretty lucky actually i don't know if you want to talk about this or you try to distance yourself from it, but you worked for, with dan andrews or for I dan did. andrews yeah 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 um have you found the dan bashing as someone who'd been there you know working with him and working as part of that sort of government apparatus i saw so a lot so I, my time in daniel andrews office finished just you know sort of in the 20 tw early 2019 mm -hmm. february 2019 i stopped working for him and then we had the federal election and the pandemic obviously happened start of 2020. So I, I left about a year before the pandemic. And, but a lot of my friends were still in the office. Most of the people who I worked with yeah. were still there. And obviously Daniel was, you know, was still <coughs> premier. And I saw what it took out of you know, my, like my, my dear friends. And it was, it was the most physically and emotionally exhausting experience of their working lives. Many of them have had to go on and move on and just have a break from politics because of the sheer amount of work, the pressure and the sense of responsibility that they had in that office to try and steer the state through this pandemic that, that we really didn't, we really didn't have a sense of, of, you know, like the, people sort of say there wasn't a rule book. I mean, you know, you have a sense of what to do in the pandemic, but more so don't for a second underestimate the impacts of the decisions and the awareness of how difficult these decisions were. I mean, we were literally talking about, do we, you know, do, does the state interfere with people's livelihoods and mental health, or do we have a situation where we potentially have our hospital system overrun? And, and you know, like what, like that's not a, that's not a decision between do I, yeah. you know, Something, something good and something bad. It's, a, it's, it's, it's two awful decision. decisions. Yeah. And, and, and that took a massive toll on people internally. And it's not to extract sympathy. I mean, people choose to be involved in these organizations. And certainly Daniel Andrews is, you know, is someone who, who is formidable and has a, you know, has a, has a, thick, a thick skin. But he, you know, he, felt, he felt the weight of his decisions. And I think he will be the very first person to put his hand in the air and say, I hope that the worst of the pandemic is behind us. And I hope we're able to re rebuild our community and our sense of country and our sense of statehood in a way that is, you know, is far more functioning and far more open and alive and remembering all the wonderful parts of what make us love and want to live in Victoria. He will be on a collision course to get there and not to go back to where we were under the pandemic. So... Look, people can people can be critical, and that's fine. And 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 you know, mate. Like, of course, the Victorian government made mistakes throughout the pandemic. But I do think that you know, I saw up close how much how hard people tried. It wasn't out of sense of cruelty. It was a sense of responsibility. The people wanted to do their best, and it was a, just a really shit situation. And hopefully, we don't go back. What do you take out of that as a federal MP? The juggle between state and federal responsibilities and where there might be gaps and, hmm. you know, should you guys get elected, is there any plans to, I don't know, change or, or drive some change in that, in that sort of relationship? Because it seemed pretty disjointed in the end with lots of different things going on and lots of finger pointing and yeah. any organization in general where you don't have to take responsibility for stuff is always a challenge, so. So I don't wanna, I'll try and give it as fair and balanced answer on this as possible because obviously, you know, I'm, I'm an opponent of Scott Morrison, so I guess everyone listening should take my response with a grain of salt and, and analyze it you know, from their regard. But I'd say the good thing that Morrison did was 
early days. You know, early days, they increased the job seeker amount, they increased, they created the job keeper program. You know, we would have designed it slightly differently, but the majority of it was inherently good. And they created this national cabinet where they really, the purpose of it was to try and bring the states and territories into the same room. What evolved from that was Victoria ended up getting an outbreak because of the hotel quarantine scenario. And that outbreak was a sustained outbreak where we ended up having 730 cases, which everyone was freaking out about uh, because we didn't have any vaccines and it was deadly. It was 4%, killing 4% of people who had this bloody thing. Uh, And Morrison made a choice at that moment to kind of leave behind this sort of unifying approach and start picking apart and, and blaming the Victorian Labor government for what essentially was a you know, a cyclical problem in a pandemic that Victoria ended up facing the same thing that New South Wales ended up facing. Uh, And Morrison, I think, made the crucial mistake there of trying to avoid responsibility and put responsibility on the state government. And in the end, state premiers took responsibility because, you know... Someone had to. Someone had to. And, And I think... Yeah, so I think that what what has to be learned is that we need to reunify the country. We can't be in these difficult scenarios. You know, you can criticise people for the decisions that they made, but you can't criticise Daniel Andrews for being willing to step up and make decisions. Whereas Scott Morrison wasn't willing to step into the firing line and make health decisions. When in, the, in actual fact, in the early days, he was the one who was announcing the health policies. He was the one who was announcing the limits on... 500 people, 100 people, 10 people. He stood up with Brendan Nelson, who was the chief health officer at those early days of the pandemic, and they were the ones actually making the decisions. Whereas then it became state by state. I think the key lesson is, is you cannot play politics in the pandemic. You, you know, Just because things were difficult, politicians need to absorb the difficult decisions and, and be willing to make them. And Don Perrottet, I don't necessarily agree with everything the guy does, but he made some difficult decisions as soon as he became the Premier, and I respect the fact that he was willing to make them. And yeah, so I, you know, especially on the pandemic. So to answer your question, I think Morrison started off better than he finished on the pandemic. And in actual fact, there were moments where he acted pretty irresponsibly, and he acted not in Victoria's interest, he left Victorians on their own. And I think that we can't do that, no matter what the political persuasion of state and territory governments, the federal government has to work with them. You mentioned you, obviously you're an opponent, you're on the other side of the aisle. Mm. Um, Over the other side of the road is is a a seat that I'm fairly certain has never been held by anyone except the Liberal Party in in, uh, what used to be Balaclava, but Goldstein. Or Goldstein in in, uh, in Brighton with Tim Wilson. Yeah. And so we're in a bit of a weird spot Mm. here. where we've got the legacy of Melbourne ports, but we've also quite an affluent area. Mm. Why the Labor Party when you're making a decision to get into doing something? Mm. Uh, one of the one of the things, and I think it's worth picking up. It's a great frustration of mine, but I understand why people are feel uh, frustrated in the system in general. Is you just get this argument that oh, they're all the same. Yeah, everyone's the same. They're all shit. Yeah. They all lie through their yeah. teeth. They're all just looking out for themselves yeah. and their mates what's the point yeah. you know blah 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 uh i'm of the i'm of the conviction that maybe no one represents you 100 percent the way you think everything mm. should go i'm certainly in that camp but but there's definitely better and worse yeah. and we should lean towards better wherever yeah, we sure. can um but why you know why not an independent why why not the yeah, other? it's a really good question look i I think the first thing to say is that no political party is perfect. I mean, of course we're not, you know. Of course any organisation has great parts and, and, you know, not so great parts. The thing, that, the thing that attracted me to the Australian Labor Party was the experiences of my family and, and the sort of life that we get to lead in this country. My grandparents were all born in different countries. We're a migrant family. and. My grandparents didn't get to go to school, didn't get to finish school. They left school when they were 14. Uh, my grandfather was a pastry chef. He was, you know, he was, he worked with his hands. Uh, and my father, you know, my father was able to finish school. He had health care. You know, my, they were a poor family living in, in Sandringham and then Elwood, in the poor streets of Elwood when it was... Yeah, people won't remember that, not, I don't not, think, not, now. Not, they not realestate.com, they won't, no, know. No, they won't know. Elwood's it. evolved nicely <laughs> um, from where my parents, my father lived there, you know, and my grandmother, she was an asylum seeker 
uh, on my mum's side uh, from from Nazi Germany, and and she was able to come here and go to university and live a life. And I, and I think that from that generation to to now having a grandson who was a member of parliament, it, it you know my, uh, my cousins are doctors and you know and artists and all sorts of different you know contributing to our society in all different ways. Uh, my, you know, my brother builds websites. Like we're all able to do what we wanted to pursue because we had an equ- equity of opportunity and we had a chance to, to have social mobility in this country. And part of that was the fact that Gough Whitlam brought in for a university education. Part of that was the fact that Bob Hawke gave universal health care. Part of it was the fact that, uh, that our education system in this country especially public schools are funded by government. And I think that the Labor Party helped shape the lives of Australians in a way that really my family and the position that I would be in if I didn't recognize the fact that unless governments help create social mobility and, and, and opportunity in, in our country, then it's, it's gonna disappear and it is disappearing right now. And, I, and I, you know, maybe we can explore that a little bit about, about what sort of opportunities face the next younger generation of Australians. But for me, the Labor Party was the party that has always cared about that. It's always cared about, it doesn't matter what your work is, you should be able to leave a good life in Australia. You should be able to have financial security. You should have safety at work. Uh, it, you know, it, 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 it respects the rights of an individual by working together as a collective. And, and that for me fundamentally was something that I believed in and, and that I feel proud to be a part of. Um, you know, I think the Liberal Party, I think the Liberal Party has been a, you know, they, they are they are a worthy force in this country in terms of the way in which they have been able to form governments and they, you know, they have they have held some level of stability in this country. And John Howard, you know, the best thing he did was take on the gun lobby and, and won. So there's certainly they've done good things. I'm not as sort of blinkered as that, but but I do think that in terms of being willing to take on market forces in the interest of ordinary Australians in order to ensure that Australians have access to opportunity. The Labor Party is the only party that has really dedicated itself to that cause. And, and if we don't, if we allow the Liberal Party to continue to just oversee the market forces evolve in the way in which they're heading, younger Australians are going to find it really difficult to get into the housing market, to find financial security, to have secure full-time work if that's what they want. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and then of course, the, you know, the solidarity to act on climate change. All of these things, I think the Liberal Party is letting the country down at the moment. But, um, but that's, why, that's why I'm a member of the Labor Party. That's why I'm seeking to try and help form a Labor government. And yeah, there is a, there's a lot of work that the Labor Party potentially has ahead of us, um, but I'm proud to be a member of it. One of the one of the uh, challenges that I see um, as someone who who pays a lot of attention and obviously inequalities and, and challenges is part of my my work every day is understanding communities, understanding the you know macro and microeconomic mm. circumstances that surround all these challenging things, and we, we will touch on it. Um, but one of the great uh, I suppose strengths of the coalition government is that it's a coalition, and so they're able to hold I suppose. Um, positions that occupy more extreme ends of the spectrum without appearing to contradict mm. the coalition's point of view between the National and the, and the Liberal Party. Something that comes up only when the newspapers want to complain about it or talk about punching on is factions. And I don't think the lay person has a, much of an idea mm. about what that really means and, and sort of, I suppose, practically how that manifests in the Labor Party mm. with, between the sort of left and right factions mm. across the country and how that tension might also be a little bit of a handbrake that the coalition maybe doesn't have because they're able to, they don't have to find unified messages for the whole country in the way that they can appeal mm. very specifically to certain electorates yeah. with certain candidates knowing full well that they'll be pulled in together under this coalition government later on. Well, there's a bit in that. I mean... So, so we, we are not we are the only party seeking to govern in our own right, yeah. and we are the only party that doesn't want to form a coalition. We want to elect a majority Labor government. We actually think it's in the country's interest to have that level of stability. To have after all of the pandemic, you know, do we really want sort of 
the country being pulled in all these different directions. Yeah. You know, we, we need to have some level of stability. It's actually really important for our economy and for government functioning in a, in a sort of stable way. It's probably been a while too because we had the hung parliaments yeah, and then we had sort of the changing of the prime ministers and then yeah. we've had three years of a stable, stable elected government but pandemic in the middle of it. Oh, yeah. So it's been a while really since it's been a good, solid run at it. Totally, totally. And we change prime ministers too often in this country, but I think we should do it one more time <laughs> and, then, and then we can settle for a bit. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think that the National Party and the Liberal Party... They, they, do, they have managed to find um, sort of an equilibrium that sort of served both parties. But don't think for a second that they, uh, you know, that, they, that there are sort of deep-seated dis- dislike between the two of them. Um, and they also have, ab- they've absolutely got factions within them. The Nationals have factions. The Liberal Party has factions. The Greens have factions. There, there's factions everywhere. Yeah. And all factions really are, are organising tools of big organisations. They're ways of people coming together and organising in a way that, I mean, I guess the most simple way of, of thinking about it is if you control the majority of the majority, you control the majority. You know, if, you, if there's five people in an organisation and it's a democracy, you only need to hold, control three of them. And Barnaby Joyce is the perfect example of that. There's 21 members of the National Party. 11 of them wanted him to be the leader and then for he because 11 people wanted Barnaby Joyce to be the leader of the Nationals he gets to be the deputy prime minister of this country so and and then there's the McCormack faction which is now 10 people who didn't want Barnaby Joyce to be the mem- you know the, the leader so there are factions in in all things and there's certainly factions in the Labor Party um, and the sort of most broad definition of them is the left and the right uh, beyond that the the um, where they were the most pronounced was was really when Labor got itself into an unelectable position where it was kind of became this protest party that probably reflected more of the Greens today than the, than the sort of the Labor Party of today. Um, and, and, you know, the Greens have a purpose, sure, like, but they're not a party of government and, and and that's pretty obvious. So I don't think that's really that controversial. Um, and then the Labor Party's factions kind of tried to turn and extract the Labor Party, especially before Gough Whitlam was elected in 1972, uh, to turn it back into a party of government and, and stop it from just being sort of, you know, we're not a debating society in the Labor Party. We are a party to seeking to form government. Uh, and we want to help elect Labor governments and try and steer the country and create change. So factions really are are different ideas about how do we do that Mm -hmm. and how do we, what policies, what focuses, what emphasis, what's important. uh, And and it's an organising tool of the Labor Party. And at its best, it helps push the Labor Party into a position where it does become more electable and it does become more representative of different parts of our country. So I don't necessarily think it's... it's but at its worst, it's people bitching and moaning and oh, totally. having a go you know, at each other. Yeah, it's like any organisation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like at yeah. its worst, you know, it's, if you get... But, but, but that's less about the factions and more about the people involved. And, and you know, I always thought that there are two types of people in the Labor Party. There are, there are those who look inwards who are constantly focused on the machinations of the party. And then there are those who are looking outwards. And what does the Labor Party mean for Australia? What does it mean for the people that we represent? And they're the people who are constantly talking about new ideas and talking about policy and talking about, you know, about, about how do we use the Labor Party as a vehicle to help make the country better? And it's pretty obvious usually who's who. And, and, you know, and the Labor Party at its best is not a party that talks about itself. It's a party that recognizes that it can be a fantastic vehicle for change in this country. It can help create opportunity for people. It can help move government resources to assist the people of Australia. It can help lift the living standards of people in our country. Uh, how do we organise it and focus it and focus this great movement of potential uh, for good? And how do we uh, you know, do what's needed to be done in terms of organising the party and steering it in the right direction? It's a big ship and it's hard to control sometimes. How do you how do you balance the I guess there's tension between representing your little pocket of fifty thousand voters, yeah, uh, national interest on a broad scale, so mm. also re- representing people in the Kimberley in the other yeah. corner of the country, um, and having an outward looking focus as as I, I believe um, you at least want everyone to think you do, and I, I believe that you do, but you know I've, I'll, I'll hedge it so it doesn't look like I'm fawning, but. Yeah. 
because obviously there's a tension between looking after what's best for you. And we probably see this play out the most in, in coal towns and in Queensland yeah. and in rural areas where they say, well, it's all well and good that this is good for everyone else, but this will be no good for us. So we don't want to do mm. whatever this thing is, um, particularly around renewables and, and things of that nature. And then how do you take your own personal ideas and beliefs and, and viewpoints and and take them into a party when parties are notorious for grinding people into the, the mean and removing the opportunity to get up and go, this is what I believe in mm. and being sort of mushed in the party room to having to be just an apparatus of, a, of the bigger machine based mm. on you know five, uh, three votes out of five mm. or 11 votes out of 21. That's a fascinating question. I mean, I guess I would, I would take up one part and say that in my experience, the Labor Party has actually been the exact opposite. It's been the party that's helped me find my voice and it's been the movement that both as becoming a member of parliament, it's giving me that platform and that opportunity to have a platform and to express my views uh, both internally and around the country that has been just such a privilege. It's, it's such a privilege to be a member of parliament uh, that I get, to, I get to participate in our national debate in, in, in the ways in which I do. And, and, and it absolutely is, is, is due to the fact that the Labor Party has given me this opportunity. So I, I would actually say that the opposite is true, is that the Labor Party has, in, 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 you know, I mean, obviously there are, you know, there's a level of party discipline and, you know, we have to be focused on what we think is going to help us win elections. But internally within the party, I have absolutely been encouraged to put forward policy ideas, to talk about, uh, to talk about different things. I wrote a whole policy piece on housing policy in this country called The Crumbling Australian Dream uh, by, with the McKell Institute. If you're suffering from insomnia and you're watching this podcast, <laughs> go, go, go check out The Crumbling pick, Australian Dream. Go and pick up, a, yep. go download that off the internet, um, download your free copy. And, um, but, but it absolutely, you know, Jason Clare, who's our shadow housing minister, when I came to him with this idea saying, man, I want, you know, we're in lockdown, I want to write about housing policy. He said, go for it and let me know how I can help. Fine, but go ahead, mate. Bring me anything that makes my job easier. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. <laughs> Puts, bring me some ideas. Yeah. And, 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 and that, was, that was such a, you know, such a, like it was such a good position to be in that I was able to, you know, Jason's a great guy, but um, to be able to have a platform to discuss it. You know, Jason launched my policy. Kevin Rudd, the former prime minister, we did a big function at the Pride Centre a couple, about a month ago. And, you know, we spoke about how government can leverage off the private sector and work towards creating more safe and secure housing in this country. And it was, you know, and I, that would never have happened had I, not, had I not been given this opportunity by the Labor Party. So on that sense, I think that, I think the Labor Party for me has been a fantastic vehicle to do the complete opposite to help me find my voice and to help me find my passions and my ability to advocate on different issues. In regards to how do you balance the interests of your electorate with the wider country and let's i think you brought up the, the you know the issue of climate change and, and regional communities in queensland and others i think this is you know this is such an important question right because politics really matters you yeah. know like politics really matters and this is a small interlude where um the yes. camera i managed to break the camera on my right uh, <laughs> too many handsome joshes on this camera god damn it um well, you can't shout at people and dictate to them about saying what's you know this is what you have to do. Yeah, it's not how democracy works. In fact, I've never met an Australian who appreciates being told what to do. People don't, people don't want to be told what to do and think. What you need to do as is, you know, we are all part of a society. We're all part of a, you know, this democratic country, and we have to talk with each other. And I think last election, you know, when you're talking about some of these communities who sort of push back on the convoy of people who went up to Queensland, you know, screaming at them saying, you know, your, you know like, your jobs need to be sacrificed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like, like, of course they went back and said, get stuffed, right? Like, and I think that that's something that we've really tried to address when talking about climate policy in this country, because we, we really, we really have to get on with this. Right? Yeah. I mean, the IPCC today... Antonio Guterres, the the um, Secretary General of the United Nations. I mean, he's you know writing op eds saying, like, we're running out of time. We need to get cracking. We need to reduce our emissions by 2030. This is the decade to do it. Uh, we need countries like Australia to lift their ambition. And, and we've still got Tony Abbott's 26 or 28 percent emission reduction target for crying out loud. So we need to do it, right? 
But how do we bring people with us? That's like that's the question of this election when it comes to climate policy. How do we bring people who rely on fossil fuel industries with us on this journey of climate change? Now, they understand, and, and we have had so many conversations with workers and miners and people working in different industries in the Hunter Valley in Queensland. They understand that the world isn't going to be as it is forever. The question is, is what are we doing to ensure that their kids have a future? Yeah. And when we talk about climate change, you know, Joe Biden, I think, put it the most succinctly I've, I've heard anyone say it. He said, climate change equals jobs, good union jobs. You know, that was what that was what Joe Biden, the president of the United States, said about climate change. It, and it really is. And, and all of our climate policy is about creating jobs, jobs in the regions. We're going to we, we've modeled out that uh, with our climate policy, we estimate around 600,000 new jobs are going to be created in Australia. Five of every six are going to be in the regions. Uh, when you think about our offshore wind farm, which the government's talking about um, even today in the media, uh, T- like these things are 300 meters tall. They're made of steel. They require a whole lot of, you know, they're out in the in the in the ocean beds. They require a whole lot of maintenance, not only to install them, but also to maintain them. These are labor-intensive industries. This is big industrial policy, and there are thousands and thousands of jobs involved in them. When we're talking about maintaining and building solar farms in the desert, I mean, we have the equivalent of the Sahara Desert in our country that is completely not being utilized at the moment like when you talk about what is going to make Australians money in the future, when you talk about what's going to help power manufacturing, make the cost of business cheaper, it's cheaper and cleaner energy, but it's jobs created with new industry. And I think how we bring people with us on this journey is by saying, look, you know, your work, your work is honorable, right? If you're a miner and that's how you fed your family for the last three generations, then that like that deserves our respect. And you've worked hard and you've helped, help create a product that has powered our country from poverty into you know a sense of of development and wealth and and that is a an amazing worthy thing but the reality is that we have a scientific problem before us that we need to decarbonize our economy uh, and there are other countries who we sell all this stuff to that are also on this same journey so what are we going to do uh, when when the caravan moves on and what are we going to do in the meantime so that when like, for example, the Arara coal fire power station shuts down five years early because it's just so uneconomical compared to renewable energy. You know, what's going to be there to replace it? And, and that's how I think we bring people with us, is that it's not about screaming at people. It's about saying, well, hang on a second. I want to plan for this future. What's going to make this country money? What's going to help your kids have a full-time job? It's, it's renewable energy. It's low emissions technology. It's hydrogen. It's electric vehicles. It's manufacturing in this country. It's rare earth minerals. It's the stuff that this, this industries that don't even exist really at the moment. That's what's going to power this country and our economy for the next 50, 100 years. Is, it, is one of the challenges that we're not great at 50 to 100 year policy in general here? Like that there's a lot of chopping and changing. You know, you've alluded to the Prime Minister's changing to regularly policy changes, maybe focusing on some of the wrong things. I would certainly argue that some of the things that come up in Parliament, probably not mm. the most urgent and pressing mm. uh, sort of issues. Is it, is it an issue that we don't have good horizons on some of these challenges? That yeah. we don't create an, an environment of certainty for, for anybody, let alone like regions, investors, mm. industry, those sorts of things? Yeah, I mean, clearly. How do you overcome that in a three-year term, I guess, is the, is the sort of follow-up bit, yeah, you know? How yeah. do you set policy for 15 years when you might not be in in three? Well, I think the first thing is that government needs to look beyond just the immediate political need. And governments that have vision, are, you know, are often rewarded. And, you know, I, I, look at, I, I look at the current federal government and I go, like, what is the legacy that they're leaving? And where do they where do they take? What's the country going to look like in ten year ten years if Morrison remains the prime minister? Wages are going to remain stagnant. Casualisation of the workforce is probably going to go up. I don't think we're going to make much progress on climate change. Universities are going to be sort of patchy in their fun. Like there's yeah. so many different areas yeah, yeah. where you kind of go, well, well, what what's actually their vision for this country? Are we going to fix the aged care crisis? Are we going to fix fix childcare? And and I'm not being critical because they're our political opponents. I'm being critical because I actually don't think they've put forward ideas of how they're going to make our country and take our country to manage some of the challenges of the future. 
So the first thing is that the political parties actually need to offer solutions to these things. And I think that that's what elections are all about. They're about offering ideas and alternatives to how we manage the challenges of our society. But then also, you know, I do think that our terms of, of governing are too short. I think we should have four year terms because we've got an election cycle that can be anywhere between two and three years at the moment, where really, you know, it's two and a half to three and a half years, where really, you know, you just finish an election cycle, you set up a government, and then within a, within a year, you're back campaigning again. And it's kind of, it, 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 it does eat up government, and then all of a sudden, you're back in the political toing and froing of government. And yeah, so I think that that's a question that needs to be looked at four year fixed terms to bring it in line with some of the states and some of, you know, and the United States. I think that's probably a better system of government. Um, but, but ultimately the answer to your question lies with political parties putting forward ideas. You know, what are the things that you want to do? What's your vision for this country? Do you want to transition our country towards renewables? Do you want to uh, try and lift wages in this country? Do you want to try and tackle housing affordability in this country? Uh, and if you're not offering solutions to that, then Maybe you don't deserve to be the one in charge. Did you find in the last election that there were too many solutions though and people just sort of tuned out? Because I felt that personally, um, look, it's no mystery that I'm, I'm not a fan of Scott Morrison and I, I think there's massive gaps in the um, in the in the, the way the current government has, has sort of handled a lot mm. of things and, and their vision for the future as well. Um, where the challenge is, is like, well, who's got the better vision? Mm. And I thought that... Uh, in the last election that some of the policies that Labor have were good and then they didn't they didn't win and I thought okay here's a chance to maybe educate or enroll people in that vision and it seemed like it kind of got thrown out a bit they went all right well, this isn't going to win this isn't the deal let's shelve all that and then sort of start again and I thought oh that makes it hard as someone who wants to see commitment to a vision mm. difficult vision you know and go how do we like you said how do we bring people together mm. and, you know, if we, if we really believe these things to be integral to, to moving the country forward, how hard is it to be politically expedient, tell a good story and not change those positions all mm. the time as a, as a party or as a representative? It's a really good question. And anyone who says that, that one election or one thing cost Labor the last election is oversimplifying yeah. things. You know, I, I, and don't get me wrong, as, as a candidate at the last election, I, I put everything I, I had into trying to, trying to sell the policies that we put forward. I mean, I, I believed in them and some of the difficult taxation reforms that we were putting forward, they were, you know, they were worthy policies and worthy of debate and worthy of consideration. I think the Prime Minister skillfully took apart some of the vulnerabilities and some of the bigger targets in our in our. Um, in our offering and we kind of had to dust ourselves off and go all right we're going to keep some of it we're going to drop some of it we can't you know the definition of insanity is doing exactly the same thing and expecting a different result and as much as you know it goes back to what I said like we're not a debating society in the Labor Party we, we want to form government and and the Liberal Party is a party that's bloody good at winning elections. They know how to tap into the nervousness and the psyche of Australian people, and they are notoriously good at keeping us out of federal government. Um, now, that doesn't mean that, that we can't be ambitious. It just means we have to be uh, really smart about how we, um, how we, what we bring to the Australian people and do it in a way that connects with Australian people. I mean, there's no point putting on putting forward ideas that people aren't, aren't interested in. Where is that line between engaging young people and not freaking out boomers? Particularly like around economics and things. Yeah. I mean, we've got, I don't know, well, like we talked about before, Elwood, you know, there was, when I was young, around here, there used to be the heroin toll used to be in the paper next to the mm. road toll. And, mm. you know, there was early days, this was not a, not a great place to live just down the road. There's mm. incredible problems in, in that space. And now people have just gotten very comfortable with the idea that their properties are just always going to go up. They're yeah. always going to make heaps of money on it. Oh, well, interest rates have been low, so I can't live on the interest on my super, but I'm, I'm 30% average house price increase in the mm. country. How do you find the policy that doesn't say you guys have to pay for this without just picking the smallest group of, of voters to, yeah. to pin that on? Well... That's not really what motivates us either. I mean, it goes back to like, why are we in this thing? You know, we're not in, so government isn't 
government isn't the, the, the end, right? We're not in it to just beat the Liberal Party. We're in it to, to use government to do good things for this yeah. country. And, you know, I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't be in it just to win elections. It, like, elections are so hard. Democracy is hard work. It's exhausting. And you can't do it unless you believe in it. And you mm-hmm. can't do it unless you actually want to use government to, to do things for the people that we're privileged to represent. So, and that, that results, you know, if you find that balance between, well, what are we, like, what's going to help deliver success? Because there's no point being in opposition talking about all these great ideas that we can't implement. But at the same time going, well, we're not here just to, you know, we're not here just, we're not born to rule. We're here because we want to earn a chance to govern for this country in order to help improve the lives of Australians. And, and, and I think where we get that balance right we you know therein lies government and and because it's something that people it matters for their lives as well what does that mean on a, on some of the issues that i think we're debating right about now if you're if you're 18 or 21 and you're about to enter into the workforce you're more likely than ever to work into a casual, walk into a casualized job you're more likely not to be earning having access to sick leave to i you know not in leave. victoria well, now, now they've got a casual sick leave. They've got. They've got. Um, that in some industries, they are going to have portable um, sick leave, which is a really good thing. Um, but but many of your entitlements in some industries, you yeah, know, like you just not. It's not available to you. Plus superannuation and other things, you don't doesn't accumulate. And and you know what does that have effect on on your ability to get into the housing market and get into. You know, to earn, earn enough money to buy a deposit, you know, to get into the housing market with less than fifty thousand dollars deposit is just near on impossible. Yeah, and and that's really difficult to screw, scrap together. And that's with low interest rates. If they start going up, yeah. then it's going to go even higher. So, like, it's 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 really really hard to get into the housing market. It's even harder if you're in a casualized job. Uh, and so, how do we start to tackle some of these issues? And when you're talking about, well, how do we how do we you know, bring people with us, but how do we talk to young people? Well, it's important that young people have a pathway from casualized work to full-time and secure work. We're going to legislate so that they do, and so that if you're in an organization for more than two years, you should have a pathway towards having secure full-time work to be able to get into that mortgage and to be able to try and get into the housing sector. We need to help build more homes. We can't just have government pumping up demand uh, we have to deal with supply and the fit and labor is going to get the government back into that program of building more homes for Australians and not to bring down the cost of pricing but to build more homes that potentially are more affordable to more people and like the other big issue is climate change which doesn't matter if you're old or you're yeah. young you, you, like we have to do this yeah. you know we like we actually have to do this Josh and and I think that young people you know this is the vietnam war of our young generation like this is the issue that binds young australians that they are fiercely aware of what it means for them what it means for our planet what it means for their ability to even have a family and have kids i mean my daughter is three years old i'm hoping to be on this planet to enjoy it with her for the you know for a a little while yet and and my and my wife um of course yeah bring her along yeah yeah yeah, she's 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 a cougar she's older than me um (laughs) but no but we you know like them you know my family are everything to me and i want to be here on this planet to enjoy it uh and i want to pass on you know but we can be the the generation of people on this planet that help turn into a decarbonized and more sustainable future it's a really exciting thing it's something i hope to achieve in, in my time and it's something the labor party's putting some really substantial policy that I think will bring the country with us on this. So, look, I really hope we get an opportunity to address some of those issues and how do we bring people across all ages? Well, you know, we do offer ideas and we offer ways in which we can tackle some of the big issues that confront people in this country. And if we get given the privilege of being in government, then we're gonna do our best to address them. To what extent are people voting for individuals versus voting for the party when when people are going to the polls? Because you know, say, so, oh, I don't want this guy. I mean, obviously, I don't vote in Cronulla. You know, I, so w- what influence do I have on whether or not Scott Morrison gets another term or, you know, Volder Dutton or, you know, whatever. Or, <laughs> P. <laughs> Pistol P. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so to what extent are we having an effect in the electorate voting for people who aren't in our electorate or voting for a party, even though we might be voting for, and not to, not to poo poo being a backbencher or anything like that, but someone who isn't in the front. Yeah. all the time of people's minds as well as obviously mm. that 
front seat of parliament where you get to you know whinge from the front totally i mean i think it's worth something but uh, ultimately i think what people vote on and this is my impression is what is what does this election mean for them and their loved ones that's that's what that's what motivates people at the ballot box i i truly believe you know it's it's which party or who represents or what is government going to mean for them and their family and that's that's still i think the biggest tr- motivating factor beyond that what what you know as much as we would all like to think that we are god's gifts to politics the the truth is is that i wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for the labor party i wouldn't have gotten elected if it wasn't for being the labor candidate in in mcnamara and and i'm 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 you know i, I belong to a team and i have to operate within that and and i think that I was elected as the Labor candidate. I wasn't elected as Josh Burns, the independent. I was elected as Josh Burns, the, the Labor member for McNamara. And I think the same is on the other side, that, that we do owe political organisations and political brands you know, a big part of our opportunity to represent people in, in the federal parliament. Uh, Can you just drop... Jo- jo- like Craig Kelly obviously left just after the election. Mm-hmm. He got voted as a Liberal and then left. And then mm-hmm. now he's... Um, you know, UAP, yeah, yeah, yeah Palmer. Whatever. Yeah. Um, could you do that? I'm not saying you're going to, but is that the mechanism? You can get voted in on a ticket and then be like, I'm out, and then just be an independent for the remainder of the term and then obviously suffer the wrath at the next yeah, election. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you can, you know, you yeah, can. it's possible. You can, but, um, but... This is a technical question as yeah, opposed yeah, to, but, would I mean, you do I it? I have I'll no plans yeah, to do yeah, that. No, no. Um, I, I'm, I'm very happy where I am. Yeah. Um, it was something that had come up the other day and I was like, I actually am not 100% sure how that works. If it's you become can just... a lot less common these days. It, it used to happen where members of parliament actually did swap parties quite... Wasn't Hughes a member re- of like four different parties? Yeah, or yeah we've had prime ministers have been yeah. prime ministers of multiple parties as well. So it, 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 do, it did happen a lot more frequently than it does now. Now it has become... A little bit more taboo, mm-hmm. where where you you know certainly between the two major parties you would have far less crossover between the coalition and the Labor Party, um, but but it is possible, and I think Craig will lose his seat because he wasn't elected as because people loved Craig Hughes. They were uh, Craig Kelly. though he was elected because he was on the Liberal Party ticket in a seat where it's a safe Liberal seat. There's a few disgruntled Liberals at the moment. Any danger of holding the hand over the aisle and saying guys you want to jump, you want to jump ship well, I reckon I reckon it would improve a few of their chances in, in the inner city uh, like you know it would it would um, it, there's a few of them that probably would be thinking the liberal brand's going to be a bit toxic some of them aren't even putting no the they just get rid of it I've, seen, I've been up in Wentworth I've seen yeah, yeah. In the, in Mr. The Teal up there yeah. um, but but ultimately also I think I think that you know, if you elect the Liberal, that their vote will be for Scott Morrison to be the Prime Minister. Yeah. And if I'm elected to the federal parliament, my vote would be for Anthony Albanese to be the Prime Minister of this country. And and that, I think, is factored into people's consideration, not because of whether they like me, dislike me, like Labor, dislike Labor or whatever. It's it's what does that mean for them and their family? That's what That's what political parties really should be focusing on. It's not about how much you like me as a bloke um, you know, even though you know, obviously very likable, great fun, yeah. great fun ripper. You know, like, you know, like just basketball. Potentially, maybe the tallest person in parliament. Would you be the? Would no, you be no, no. There? There's, 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 um, Garth from uh, Groom, Garth Hamilton. Garth he, from Groom sounds like a kid's book. Yeah, yeah. He's like Lurch. Um, he's, <laughs> he's a big, he's a big boy. And then our new guy, who's the candidate in Hunter to take over from Joel Fitzgibbon is a guy called Dan Repicholi, who's six eight. Okay. And um, he's a big man. He's a big boy and I'm trying to recruit him to the parliamentary basketball team. Although I'm not sure Having not- seen some of the PMs have a crack at sports you should, I yeah. don't know if I don't know if anyone wants to see that too. It's not. Play. It's not flash. It's not flash <laughs> ball. Uh, it's not flash hoops. I'll, I'll be honest. The APH basketball. But we have. We, we do. We do do a bit of exercise on a Tuesday before Parliament. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's what that's what people vote on. And and if you are thinking of voting Liberal this election, it's going to mean Scott Morrison will be the Prime Minister. And if you're thinking of Labor, then it'll mean Anthony Albanese might have the chance. You had much time with Albo. Yeah, I've gotten to know Anthony quite quite well over the last three years. Um, yeah, he's. I think we've built up a bit of trust. I think I think he trusts me, and I trust him, and that's important in any working relationship. Uh, I trust his judgment, and I think he's. I think he's pretty cunning uh, and pretty smart, and 
and he's also deeply, deeply cares about this country, like he really does. And I think he's going to be a really good prime minister. And the reason why I mention those two qualities is because you know that there was a there was a I can't remember which. I think it was one of the documentaries on Obama where he was sort of talking about like, there's no easy things that come across the president's desk, yeah. right? Like if it was easy, someone else would have dealt with it. Yeah, the, It's only those sort of turd sandwiches yeah. that come across the president's desk or the prime minister's desk. You need to be, you know, you need to deeply care about our country to do that job. It is a, it is a pretty intense job. Uh, but you also need to be cunning and smart and think your way through some really, really difficult uh, problems. And I think good prime ministers are strong, uh, smart, and and also uh, have a real ability to care and connect about the people that they're in charge of. And I think Anthony has all of those qualities, and I hope he is given the opportunity to be the prime minister. And if he does, I'm looking forward to working with him. Do you have ambitions to be the PM or have you got your eye on a folio? Are you even allowed to say that? Because in any other job, you're allowed to go, yeah, well, I'd love to be mailroom to <laughs> to the CEO. Yeah, to the CEO. But everyone's like, oh, I better not say it. Or is it okay from the back bench to say one day because you're not close enough to be a real threat today? Or how does that work? <laughs> it, it would not be welcome news if I... <laughs> oh, yeah. We would just say, by the way, yeah, he's yeah. going to no, have a crack. No, no. I, I, I do have ambitions to be a cabinet minister. Oh, obviously, I'd love to be. And I'd love to be able to steer our country in a particular portfolio area. And that would be a great honour to be able to sit in, in cabinet and do it. Uh, that that that's my ambition. I, I'm not shy about it. I, I would, you know, I'm not, I'm not in a hurry. I've, you've got to learn your, yeah. You know, you've got to learn the craft, and you've got to learn government. I, I've worked in government for, you know, almost ten years, and and there is still so much more to learn, and you have to be patient. Uh, but but at some stage, I, I, you know, of course, I hope I'm, I'm given the opportunity to lead a lead a government department, lead a portfolio area on behalf of australia that would be a true honor and um, very very diplomatic answer as yeah. well you know yeah, yeah of course yeah that, a little, you know a little bit of nothing doesn't going to step on anyone's toes but if it if it comes up you know we'll we'll take that opportunity it's a good one it, it, i mean it is like it's already a privilege to be a member of parliament and and to be a local member of parliament is you know nothing else matters if you're not a good local member of parliament and i, I you know I, I love mcnamara it's my home it's where i've grown up my whole life and you know and if i don't rise any further it will be you know this will still be the best gig i've ever had and i'm you know i'm very privileged to do it and but but you know, if 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 the time came up where i got an opportunity to do more then of course you know you'd put your hand up why aren't there more beards in parliament what's the deal with that is that polling is that polling related is it do people just not trust people with beards or I, I, what's the deal I, I I reckon you could grow a pretty serious beard. Yeah, it, it's pretty black, and and although I, I do get a bit of itchy, itchy sort yep. of face. Uh, my my face is a like it doesn't work with hats. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. Like you need a really specific glasses lens. Yep. Otherwise, my face can look really strange really quickly. Yeah, and if I put a beard on this thing, Josh, it gets it gets a bit weird. Yeah, yeah, it gets a bit weird. And plus. You know, like my wife, um, she puts up with me, you know, being married to me already. If I came home with a beard, that might be the... Ca- the, the Straight to the bathroom, <laughs> get that off before <laughs> that you come to the dinner That table. might be the rat that sinks the boat, you know. It, it, it might, um, it, it won't be welcome. I've always looked at politicians. It's almost a universally Western thing too. There's just not many beards. There's just not many people rolling around with a beard in not Parliament. Enough. Or, not no. enough. More Tr- beards. Trudeau. Trudeau pulled it off for a bit. Yeah, he, a little he, bit. But he's he's got a he's got a diverse face. You know, his face. Can he's be, got a good face. He's got a great face. Yeah. My face is limited. You've got. My... I've got one. You've got no range. I've got no... zero range on your this face. This is my face. This is the face. This is where you get. You put a hat on this. It's weird. <laughs> you put a beard on this. It's weird. You put a mustache on this. Triple weird. So weird. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, the, if we uh, start seeing pictures with moustache, we'll know something's gone horribly wrong. Yeah, my brother's got a moustache. Um, his face is less weird. He's got a good face. Yeah, great face. He's fitter and nicer than me. Um, yeah, no, he's... He, but he had a much easier life. I was the, I was the oldest. Yeah, mate, so that's, my parents, that's a lie. My parents had to, you know... I got I copped all of the strict parenting. And then by the time my cruisy brother got along, you know... He gets, easy. He, he easy gets, straight. Anything he needs, he gets... Uh, and yeah, he's had a great life. 
might have been there. I uh, I understand completely. Is there anything that people don't ask you? Because you probably, I mean, I don't know how much people come to you for, to ask about these things that are happening or whether whether it is the cabinet ministers who field most of the questions and do that stuff or whether someone tells you, shut up and stay out of the way or whatever. Yeah. But is there anything that you wish people would ask you that they don't uh, or haven't yet or don't ask enough? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, people, one of the things that when you become a member of parliament, my experience is that people have been really generous with their themselves and their lives and they do open up to me and they tell me about what's happening in their lives what's happening in their work or their business and what they think about a particular issue or where they want the labor party to be and and those honest conversations you know i don't want people to come and sugarcoat their conversation with me if i'm having a conversation with someone on the street i want them to be truthful and i want them to be honest with me and that's the only way that we feel more connected and we're able to be more connected to the people that we're representing and so i think i you know and i think the day that people stop talking to me and the day that people aren't interested in trying to steer and plant seeds in my head and steer the labor party in a different direction or um, or trying to have this honest conversation about what's going on in their lives then then i think we've lost touch with what's going on and so i i guess my main observation would be that I, I really appreciate when people open up and, and are able to be honest with me and talk to me about their lives. It's a privilege to be given that insight into their their world. And yeah, and I, I, I you know, I, I, I really, I really am grateful that they do. Well, I appreciate your time um, coming by for a chat. I know there's plenty of policy stuff we can talk about, but it's the thing that gets bandied around a lot. And I think something that gets lost is, is you know, the people that you're electing as people as well because also there's an element of everyone's just going to give their lines for the next you know however many weeks we've yeah. got about six weeks until yeah. the election or something you'll call it on sunday yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. we know that's going to come yours is that's a terrible idea that's a good idea blah 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 all those sorts of things and i've seen um i've seen jim talk about the reply re, uh, response budget and things yeah. like that where there's a few things like we're waiting to see what we get as well certainly from the opposition um so hopefully we do. People do engage in that, but also, as human beings, you hope that they um, get a chance to see some of the people who maybe are mm. outward looking and mm. not not just in there for their own, I guess their own gain. Um, if there's anything you wanna you wanna tell people, mm. you've got a you've got a chance to just drop it on them now. Uh, you, if you wanna <laughs> have a, a little clarion a, call, drop a truth bomb. Uh, yeah. Uh, look, I I would just say that. Elections are really important and they're an opportunity to help shape the future of our country. And you only have to look at what's happening in Russia right now where not only are the people of Russia being denied access to to democracy, the Russian government under Vladimir Putin is literally denying the people of Ukraine the opportunity to have access to a free and fair democracy. And I hope that they are that the Russian troops are withdrawn and Ukraine can find that stability and that de- democratic peace that they so yearn for and that they're fighting for and dying for. But in Australia, we, you know, it, it, it's a reminder that what we have is precious and what we have the opportunity to do is remarkable and it needs good people to be involved and it needs good citizens to be participants in that process. So whoever you vote for in this election, it doesn't I'm not, you know, obviously I want you to vote for the Labor Party, right? Of course I do. Um, But I want you to think about it first and I want you to care about it because it does matter and it matters to the future of our country. And then on terms of, you know, why I would ask you to consider voting for the Labor Party, I would say the following. Government is a privilege. It is an absolute privilege to be allowed to help steer the country and represent the people that we do in our federal parliament. It's something that I take extremely seriously and it's something that I am immensely grateful for. Um, But we are seeking to form government in this country to improve the lives of Australians and for Australians. it, it 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 is something that cannot be you know cannot be taken from the australian people it has to be earned by the australian people um so when we think about the future of what our country would be you know do you do you 
Do you see a country where we are potentially a bit more fair, where we give access to families so that they can access childcare, where we fix our aged care crisis, where we have more pathways to secure work, where we have an ability uh, to make more things in Australia and, and, and build up Australian capability and skills and invest in university and TAFE? Uh, do we have the ability to tackle the biggest problem of our generation of climate change? Uh, do we, uh, in this moment in time, hold politics to a higher standard and lift our, our political conduct via an anti-corruption commission? If you think all of these things are worthy of consideration, then I would ask you to consider voting Labor at this election. Uh, and and, and if, we, if we are held, if we do get given this opportunity to form government, then hold us to account, hold us to a higher account, uh, because it's the only thing that helps change our country to make it into the wonderful thing that it is. Mate, absolutely. Well, look, there you go. There's the thing. We'll chop that up, send it to Albo, see if we can get you that cabinet position for the, the yeah. good spruik. I don't know if you've seen this at the back end of a, of a little no, nothing podcast in the middle of nowhere, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. Albo, check this out. This is pretty yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, absolutely, mate. Look, thanks for, thanks again for stopping by. And, um, you know, we've we've had yarns previously and hopefully have some outside of election season as well. Good luck. Thanks, and, um, thanks I for I appreciate having it. Me. Oh, my pleasure. Legend.